much, Hillary. It's great to be here with everybody. And it's great to be here with some of my old Norwood friends here from high school, from grade school, from uh, uh, and some of my uh, other local friends who are here with us this evening, my relatives and my relatives and so forth. Very cool. And great to be here also with all the virtual, the people who are joining us for the live stream um, around the world, really. So I had posted this on my social media, so it would be interesting and I'm curious the ge geographical spread. Because as Hillary said, I have clients in 51 countries now. Uh, it's the magic of the internet, right? Zoom and all this virtual, uh, virtual way of communicating with people. So I teach people and help people with all the different aspects of the work that I do whether it's meditation, helping people with anxiety issues, and just feeling more balanced and so forth, or fear of death issues. My overcoming the fear of death, nonprofit work that I do around the world. Um, so today, we're gonna to talk about neither of those. We're gonna talk about uh, the, uh, the, we're gonna talk about forgiveness. Forgive the screen for <laughs> leaving us blank here, but let's be, yeah, it's a work in progress, and it's fine because right now I'm going to talk about. I'll, I'll give you a little overview of this book. I was chatting with some folks uh, where I was signing some of the books um, beforehand, and um, just give you a little overview of the book, and then we'll talk about the idea of forgiveness and love, which is the focus of our discussion tonight. So. This is a collection of 67 essays that I've written over the last, I don't know, five to eight years, many, you know, three years of them. One of them I wrote literally in the publishing process. One of my students reached out to me and she said, hey, what about manifesting things? And blah, blah, blah. I don't remember her exact question. So I wrote an essay about that. It's a great one. I don't have anything on that. So I wrote an essay. And that was my last essay in, in the book. But it's a collection that's Hillary said, of various essays, ideas to, to give people a practical, a really a nitty gritty, practical approach to how to live life in a way that, to the extent humanly possible, nothing's ever perfect, but reduce our suffering and the inconsistencies that we run into sometimes of our own doing. We cannot prevent stuff that happens outside of our control, right? Somebody else does something, other people make decisions, et cetera, et cetera. We can't control other people's decisions, but we can control our reactions to them, and we can also control our own choices, maybe sometimes in a better way. So that's the idea of all of the essays, whether I'm talking about uh, self-interest and being selfish in one of the essays, or I'm talking about personal choices and free will, free will ability to make any choice you want, you know, where you pick and choose, that kind of stuff. These principles, these ideas uh, are covered in here in order to give you very short, they're like page and a half, sometimes they're three pages long, and that's in a book, you know, if you stick it on an eight and a half, ten sheet of paper, it's like some of them are just a half page or a page, page and a half. So they're very short, um, but trying to give you different ways of looking at things that are practical for you that you can apply in your daily life today. That's the idea, okay? Um, so it's a huge range, as, we, as Hillary was saying, 67 essays uh, covering a full range of different areas. We're gonna talk about forgiveness and love tonight. So that covers several of the essays in this book. I'm gonna kind of conglomerate them and put them together in terms of one talk about forgiveness and love. But you know, when you read the book, you'll see that. My recommendation is that, so this, this, this book is obviously a print book, hello, uh, but there's also an ebook version too. So some people love ebooks and that's fine. With this book, what people find is that they, they do a lot of this, right? A lot of this, you know, like underlying, highlighting phrases and ideas that may be a different way of looking at some of these commonly, you know, commonly just, you know, thought of and described ideas, like here's one, giving and taking. So I have some different I, different angles of thinking about these things. So this one, this this book in particular, as compared to my first book, which I do the audio book of, and this ebook and the print book, this one I think is better to get as, as a print, because then you can dog your pages and stuff. People literally like leave it on their nightstand and they read a few pages, 
it kind of gets their mind in the, in the, or they look at the table of contents and they go, which, which, which of these topics is going to help me, you know, tomorrow with what I got going on? Oh, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Let me read the one about Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Literal, there's one about Thanksgiving. So, uh, anyway, the, let me just talk uh, briefly about this guy, Marcus Aurelius. Why the title of the book? Bottom line is I kind of resonate with the way he thinks. And those of you who've known me since, some of you have known me since, you know, we literally we were in elementary school together, um, know that I, I think about things, and as I've already alluded to, I think about things in a very practical way. How can we apply them in our lives, ideally immediately, to help us live more, a more smooth life? Nothing is ever flat, flat you know, with no waves. But can we live a life that doesn't have as many 150 foot tidal waves in it? You know, and if we do get hit with a 150 foot tidal wave that has nothing to do with us and our choices, can we handle it and navigate those waters a little bit more easily? So that's always my, my goal. And that happened to be his goal. So who's he, Marcus Aurelius? I'm just curious, anybody? You don't, have to, you don't have to speak, but hey, show of hands. Anybody know who, know who he is or heard of him? Yeah. So, so Marcus Aurelius, for those of you who don't know, uh, was a second century Roman emperor. But if you asked him if he was in the room today with us, he would say, Yeah, I was a philosopher. I was not a, a yeah, yes, I had this title and I had this role and I had to do all this, this job as a Roman emperor. But he would say his heart was in philosophy. Now you got to understand, when you hear the word philosophy or philosopher in 21st century Earth, you and I, we kind of think, well, oh, kind of airy fairy, sitting up in a castle, thinking about ideas and so forth. In, in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, it was very different. Philosoph philosophy was about, as I said, pragmatic, practical thought. Can we adjust our thinking so that our lives can be easier, happier, smoother, we can get along better. That's really what philosophy essentially, I'm just distilling it down to one sentence. But that's really, that was the attitude. It's very different from, from today where it's just a bunch of professors and some university stuff talking about philosophy. Very different back then. So he was a Roman emperor. So he, he was the, the empire, the Roman empire at the time, uh, it was about 70, 75 million people. That was almost a quarter of the world's population Marcus Aurelius was the leader of. But as I said, he really was a philosopher at heart. And what he did, uh, some of you who recognize the name probably know this already, what he did was he um, wrote down a lot of different, what I would call in our 20th, 21st century language, maxims, just short phrases and so forth that he would write down. To, why did he do it? He did it to help himself. Why did I write these essays? Basically to help myself and my students. So similarly, this, you see the parallelism there. He, he, he would write these maxims down. He's in the middle of some battle with Germania, you know, before Germany was a country that was called Germania, you know, with these tribes and so forth. And he's out in some middle of, you know, uh, battlefield somewhere and the battle, you know, they don't have a battle for two weeks, sometimes a month. You know, you get this hiatus, you get this, you know, break in the action, he's off in his tent and he's writing these things. Why? To help himself think more clearly. So they were contemplative, short little things that he would write down. And about 800 AD, somebody found them somewhere, whatever. And then around, and they collected them put them into like a book form and then you know, the printing press, I don't know when that came around, 1457 or something, whatever. You know, and then somebody about 300 years ago started calling them Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. But that's the history behind many, you know, that what many of you may have heard of. Oh, there's this book, uh, Marcus Aurelius wrote, it's called The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. That's the history behind it. He was just sitting in a tent he would have these ideas that would help him self-reflect and think more clearly about life, his family, his children, his wife, his soldiers, and so forth, and would write them down. Somebody collected them eventually, they called them meditations. Now they're talking about 
just to define terms to be crystal clear. We're not talking about eyes closed meditation. We're talking about, they're using the word meditation in that, that loose English way of, you know, ideas, contemplative ideas that people are thinking about, that kind of idea of meditation. So not like what I teach, which is a specific technique that someone you take in the class in order to talk about. It. This is a more general way of using the word meditation. And I'm using it that way here in my subtitle, 21st Century Meditations on Living Life. So he wrote his second century version, and this is my parallel version uh, for the 21st century, this collection of 67 essays. So that's a little background on, on who he was and, and what he did and, and, and why he wrote it and why I uh, kind of gave him a little shout out in terms of the title of my book. Because you know his his way of looking at life was very similar to mine in the sense that you know we both look at life as simply as possible and below the surface. You know you know life happens out here, of course, but to the extent that we can turn within and think about life, our lives, and how we are living our lives from a more internal uh, standpoint, that can help us externally if we're more balanced and we're more clear about how we're thinking about things. For example, forgiveness, we talk about tonight. More internally first, right? So, um, yeah, one, one last maxim I'll tell you from Marcus that I've been saying for <laughs> all my life, this lifetime, for 70 years now. I've been saying this, this, this simple maxim that, that he's been saying that he said back in the second century, 2,000 years ago, uh, control what you can control and let go of what you can't control. It sounds so simple, right? Control what you can control and let go of what you can't control. But the rubber meets the road in life always with, you know, executing on that. How can you do, you do that in your actual daily life, right? But that's something that is, is a, if you remember that one little maxim, that's something that thread you'll see through a lot of the essays in my book. It's how can we control? What can we control? And what, can, what we cannot control? What can we not control? And take more control over the stuff we can control. What, what's one fundamental thing we can control? And this fits right in with our discussion of forgiveness is ourselves, right? And we can control ourselves more than we can control other people, for sure. And we can't control everything about ourselves either because remember, when we talk about ourselves, we're in physical bodies. So sometimes, you know, we have, a, we have biological issues going on physically, mentally, emotionally, but to the extent that we can control our mental, emotional side, and to some extent our physical side in terms of exercise and how we eat and all that kind of stuff, but especially the mental, emotional side, that, I would argue, really gives us a really firmer basis, a much stronger base foundation in which to live a happier life with less suffering, which is really the goal of everything that I teach and I write about. Okay? So, um, let's talk about this idea. Forgiveness. Um, you know, we're going to talk about what it is, and, I, and I'm going to give you some different angles to think about it, hopefully. That's what I hope to do. Let me just say at the outset, those of you who've worked with me in other, some of my other classes, you know this about me already, but some of you have never uh, met me before or heard my classes, perhaps. And I take a very inclusive way of approaching ideas and your ideas and your thoughts and your beliefs. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, you don't, I'm not here to convince you to think like I do. I'm here to share ideas with you. And I want you to think about them, but then you decide whether or not part of what I'm saying makes sense, all of what I'm saying makes sense, 50% makes sense, whatever. That's for you to decide. I am not here to try to sell people on changing their ideas or changing their beliefs to be, be like me, mine. Mine are fluid. Mine are changing from as, you know, as I you know, grow and experience life and so forth and so on. So I think, you know, it would be, would be in a sense, uh, you know, dishonest for me to say, you know, my drinking, but you should, you should buy mine. My idea is in the, in the least. No, you should have your own, and you should figure out as you go through life, 
uh, what what ideas help you think maybe a little bit differently, and then you digest them, and you, if they work, great, and if they don't, you put them on a shelf. Tell people that you can take them off the shelf later and look at them and later, or maybe you just leave them on the shelf. Same thing with my ideas. So we're not talking about forgiveness here. I'm sure all of you already had some ideas of forgiveness. And if some of those ideas, those ideas work for you, great. But maybe you'll get a different perspective on forgiveness in those, those, those wonky kind of, you know, those situations where, you know, the square peg is not fitting in the round hole. And maybe you'll get some ideas from what I'm talking about tonight that may help you through those situations. Okay? So that's kind of my goal. Forgiveness. This is the definition of forgiveness in Wikipedia. And actually, I just looked this up the other day. I mean, this is fairly recently. I wrote the essay a long time ago. I never looked up, like, what's the general, uh, you know, uh, definition of the way people think of forgiveness? But this is the Wikipedia definition. I'll read the, the, just not the whole thing. I'll just read you the key part. Forgiveness, in a psychological sense, is the intentional and voluntary process by which one who may initially feel victimized undergoes a change in feelings and attitude regarding a given offense and overcomes negative emotions such as resentment and vengeance. So that's a generally accepted definition. It kind of makes sense, right? You know how we think about forgiveness. Um, then I looked over here on the Wikipedia page. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't create this Wikipedia page, but look who's here on the right side of the Wikipedia page. But Marcus Aurelius is the picture that is on the forgiveness page. Go figure. And the reason, if you can't read this, it says, Emperor Marcus Aurelius shows clemency to the vanquished after his success against the tribes, happen to be tribes in Germania. Uh, so clemency, in other words, he's showing some uh, leniency. He's not killing them, basically, is what that means. These tribes who were uh, who, who, who Rome had defeated in these German tribes, Germanic tribes. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting coincidence, right? Um, this is a close-up of, of that, uh, that, 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 that the bar relief. That's why you can see it's a little bit 3D-ish. It's a, it's a piece of sculpture that is actually literally comes out from the from the stone. The stone comes out from the wall. Um, so there you go. So that's the extent of my um, of my uh, of the slides here. Uh, but um, let's see. So here's the thing. Let's talk about forgiveness a little bit here um, in this way. This is the way I'm not going to talk about forgiveness, which a lot of people think this way. And I think it's a mistake. And, it take depth. and those of you who've gone down, who've got who thought this way, you, you know what I mean. You try to go down this road, and it takes you down a dead end, and it doesn't work. And what sometimes people think of forgiveness is, is, is like um, blaming somebody. Oh, you know, like it's a blame game, it's like guilting people. Uh, there's blame and guilt involved. Or sometimes people think of forgiveness as like, well, I forgive you, and then, um, you know, you did this bad stuff, and you get a hall pass. You remember a hall pass in high school? You know, you get a, you get a hall pass to go to the bathroom, you remember that? You know, this Mr. Peterson would grab you and he'd say, you know, <laughs> Right? Do you have your whole bathroom pass? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I have to go to the bathroom. You know? So, so, so a lot of times people think of forgiveness that way. And I, say, I, think, that's, I think that's a mistake. I, I, that's, nobody gets a hall pass for doing something bad to somebody. Right? And the other, the other thing I think is a mistake is this whole notion, you hear this idea of forgive and forget. How many people have heard that? Forgive and forget everybody. You know, we've always heard it. Forgive and forget. I think it's a mistake. That, I don't know where that, who started that, but I think that's 
they did, they did human race a disservice with coming up with that phrase because nobody ever forgets. You forget when somebody hurt your feelings or really did something really bad or abused you or whatever. I mean, no, you never ever forget. Nobody forgets. That's the reality. Okay? Now, when somebody says that, what are they really meaning? What are they what they're meaning is um, uh, well, um, we're not really going to forget about it, but we're going to move on. That's really what they mean when they say forgive and forget. But the problem with the English of that is that forget doesn't mean that. So that's why I think that in this particular case, not I'm not a word Nazi all the time, but in this case, I, I am because I think that forgiving and this idea of forgiving and forgetting leads people to feel like, oh, I can't forget. There's something must be wrong with me. The victim, per, the, abuse, the people, the person abused, then thinks, I can't forget. I can never forget about that. There must be something wrong with me. I'm not a, I'm not a holy enough person. I'm not a loving enough person. I can never forget. Whatever. No. So I think that it can cascade. You see this idea of forgiving and forget and create unintended suffering in the person. God forbid the person who's being abused, the victim. So it makes no logical sense, right? So I so I so I remove that in my thinking in the, in the essay from the equation and say we, we don't we don't use that phrase. We talk about forgiving as moving forward. That's how I suggest that we think of forgiving. We'll come back to that in a second. Before we get into that, let's talk about this idea of love first, because love do dovetails into all of this, right? This whole idea of love. Now, what do I mean by love? Love. There are several other essays in here about love. We'll just kind of distill it down to a couple of sentences. The idea of love, we, you know, we can think about love in terms of this butterflies feeling and the romantic feeling, and, and that's real. I'm not denigrating that or demeaning that. That's very real part of love. But I want to go high, I want to go higher level because I want to talk about this general principle of love and use it in the context of this idea of forgiveness. And some people know, but not a lot of people know, I don't think, that, that Jesus had a definition of love, which I really love, uh, which <laughs> I like it a lot, which is his definition of love was accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were. So you think about that, right? Accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were. So you're not there to try to change them into some other being you're letting them be who they are, he would say, and you're accepting that which is presented to you as that person. Okay? So that is how he defined love. And so it's, it's really more the idea of acceptance, if you think about it that way. Okay? And those of you who are already thinking ahead, you can see how that also translates to yourself and accepting yourself. Everything about yourself, not who you wish you were. You know, accepting what I call all of the warts and the imperfections that we all have. Nobody's perfect. It could be a physical imperfection, it could be an emotional, it could be a personality, it could be, you know, some people maybe they think they laugh too loudly or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know whatever it is, it could be anything. It, it, but everything, accepting and, and, and not trying to change those fundamentals of who we are or who the other person is, that's how he would define this idea of love. And so what, what does this idea of acceptance also kind of include? It includes non-judgment, doesn't it? The, the non-judginess, right? Because acceptance means acceptance. That means if you're not judging and rejecting and judging and rejecting in this piece and that piece. To me, I call that liking. That's, that's, sometimes you like it and sometimes you don't. But it's not loving. So we're not going to get into this in great detail tonight. But I'll just put one quick aside. There's separate essays in here about this idea of love and unconditional love. To me, unconditional love is redundant. Love is unconditional. It's not, it, you can't have conditional love. Oh, I love you conditionally. Nobody would say that. I like you conditionally. I like you, I like you when you uh, take the trash out, uh, and I don't like you when you don't take the trash out. I told you six times, you know? But I still love you. I still accept you for who you are. I mean, 
I wish you were. You see? So anyway, uh, the idea of acceptance, love, not judging. Okay? Now, let's talk about judgment for a quick second, because it's going to relate to when we talk about forgiveness, and I'm going to go through some state, different degrees of forgiveness here. And judge, this little, the little aside about judging is very important. So, you hear a lot of this in, 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 in religious and spiritual uh, workshops and you know, seminars and talks and so forth. People, you hear people say, oh, you shouldn't judge, shouldn't be judging, you shouldn't be judging other people and all this, okay? So I want to break that in, down and talk about that a little bit more clearly because it's true and it's not true. It's accurate and it's inaccurate. So yes, here's the part that's accurate. I would say, yeah, it's far be, you know, beyond me, Kelvin Chin, who's still trying to figure himself out in this eternal thing I call life. To me, to be judging Janice, you know, uh, oh, Janice's motives about this and that, blah, 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 and you know, what's Janice's state of self-awareness and consciousness or whatever? No, to me, I say, yeah, that, inappropriate. That's inappropriate, that kind of judgingness, okay? I'm just trying to figure myself out. Who I say to, to use myself as a yardstick to, to compare myself to her or other people, whatever, you know? Yeah, okay, as a quick aside, cocktail party talk, Mary Paz and I are having a, you know, a, you know, a juice together and we're joking about Janice and we can make some little, you know. Yeah, that, that's okay. But I'm talking about, but seriously, I'm talking about hanging our happiness on that kind of stuff. That's what I'm talking about. You know, no, inappropriate, but judging people's behavior. So that's internal, right? Because we're not judging people's internal state. That's what I'm saying, it's inappropriate. But appropriate to ju judge their external behavior? Absolutely, yes. Somebody's a jerk, they're a jerk. You know, they're expressed by their behavior. You you need to learn from that. You know, I mean, you don't you don't just whitewash everything. So that, I just want to make a comment about about that because I hear that a lot. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common theme in a lot of spiritual uh, talks where people just say, "Oh, you should be loving and all embrace everybody and kumbaya and everything." Okay, I get the underlying essence of what they're saying, but we need to judge people's external behavior. If we don't, we don't learn in life. Right? And we can get hurt. Right? So uh, keep that in mind as we go through our discussion of forgiveness, forgiveness tonight. And, and one of the things that I'm big on, you can kind of tell already, is helping my students understand, and I view all of you as my, my temporary students, at least for this evening, uh, helping my students understand things better looking at these ideas from different perspectives. Why? Because understanding affects our attitude. Attitude affects our beliefs. And beliefs affects our thinking. And of course, what's our thinking the basis of is our actions and our behavior. And that's going to result in happy, happier life, or life with more suffering. So uh, to me, it starts with understanding. And understanding these these ideas in, a, in as clear way as we possibly can. So let's talk about these four degrees uh, of forgiveness I just came up with. These four degrees, okay? And if you're, you got your book, if you want to look at it, it's fine. You can follow along on page 55. Um, those of you who are live streaming this also. So on page 55. So the first degree of forgiveness is the easy one. It's the simple one. It's the one where I, I talk about it as forgiveness as a simple acceptance of I'm sorry. Okay? So I'll use myself as an example. I'll give you an example. Okay? This is like a very easy one. Where you, it's, a, it's a minor slip up. You kind of hardly even notice it. And the person apologizes to you. So I'll use myself as an example. As Hillary said, you know, I grew up here in Norway. What's my name? Kelvin Chin. K-E-L-V-I-N. What's this area in Boston? What, there's a lot of Irish Catholics, right? Um, what do you think many of the teachers, my elementary school teachers, uh, finally had to correct themselves and, and get my first name right? What do you think I was called many times? Kevin, thank you. Kevin, exactly. Now, somebody comes up to me 
I had to call Kevin so many times in my life to cancel. So he simply comes and says, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm good. I, I apologize. I called you Kevin. I lifted a lot of your name. I'm so sorry. To me, that's like a first degree. You know, for me, anyway. For, for somebody else, it might not be a first degree. But for me, it's a first degree because it's happened so many times. Like, hey, I didn't even notice. I respond to all kinds of names, so it's fine. You know, <laughs> like, fine. You know, that's the first degree where it's like you hardly notice it. The person apologizes, and you say, yeah, 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 no big deal. Like, it's very, it's very minimally, not hard, not even intense at all. Very easy to say, you know, okay, yeah, yeah. We can move on. Remember? Moving on. Moving forward. That's how we're thinking about forgiving here, okay? Right. And so what's, what, and just step back for a second. Why is moving forward the way I suggest that we look at forgiving? Because who wants to get stuck? Because that's the thing. If we don't forgive, at least in the way that I'm defining it, then we're stuck. We're stuck in the mud, right? For how many years and decades stuck, you know? Is there a way to move forward? That's what you want to be asking yourself through these different degrees. Second one, a little bit more intense, okay? Forgiveness is, I accept what you did as an expression of who you were at that moment. Let me let me step this phrase that I keep using in all the degrees. Accept as a, an expression of who you were at that moment. Well, that's who they were, right? Remember the definition of love, the way Jesus defined it. Accepting the other person for who they were, not who, who they are, not who you wish they were. So at that moment, that's who they were, okay? So we're accepting that. I accept that. It was bad, but I'm okay with it. Okay? So there's a there, there, so it's a little bit more intense. You know, maybe for example, let's say you just met somebody new on some online dating website. Um, if anybody's still doing that, I, you know, I, I jumped I jumped off of them several years ago. Again. But but I was I was on for a while. And uh, in my single single days, and and the thing is, it's like um, you just met, so you're just getting to know each other, or maybe it's not online dating person. Maybe it's just maybe it's just a friend. You met, you just you're at the beginning of your friendship. You don't really know each other, yet, you know. And so somebody slips up and does something, and you know maybe hurts what somebody's feelings by saying something because you didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. You know that happened in your family. So I'm so sorry. You know, that I brought that up, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it, it, that's like a second degree. It's a little bit more intense than the first one, but it's still, it's like, you know, you, I'm okay with it. We can move on. You know, I, I'm okay with it, all right? It might bother me, maybe even ticked you off, you know? But you decide, you, yeah, I can move on. But it does bother you, okay? First one didn't even bother us. Third degree, forgiveness, as I accept what you did, as an expression of who you were at that moment, and I am not okay with it. Uh, uh. Whatever the whatever happened, you know, um, you, you're not okay with it. You know, maybe uh, Mark and I go to dinner, and uh, you know our families get together, and you know Mark and I grew up since you know Cleveland Elementary School. We got to play basketball together on high school basketball team and stuff. So we know each other. But our families don't know each other. Okay? So, so Mark and I get together, we get our families together, we're having dinner, whatever, and I say something to one of my kids, oh, tell them the story about whatever, you know? And maybe it's a little bit of an embarrassing story that I didn't realize that my kids just wanted to kind of stay kind of more nuclear within the, uh, the, the nuclear family, you know, and friends. And, and now, and now they're, they're, they're like hanging out in a limb, you know, and they, with Mark and people they don't know and his family and his kids and stuff. And, and, uh, and that kind of thing. So it's a little, they're not okay with it, okay? It bothers them and they're not okay with it. And then afterwards they say, Dad, you know, that thing you told them about me, and da, 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 da. it was really not cool. And don't do it, don't do it again. So, you kind of get put on notice in that kind of situation, right? You know that expression, you kind of you put on notice, they let you know, don't do it again, right? So it's, it's, it's a little more serious, you know? Um, or another one that happened, I'm not gonna mention where this happened, but this happened to me in my many varied career that Mark and I were talking about at dinner tonight, uh, where um, 
my my performance review was completely unacceptable. I mean, it was completely wrong in terms of what my performance was. How many people have ever been in that situation? You know, and then and then and then it affects your money, your your salary, your bonus, your whatever, your compensation on some level or whatever, your promotion ability, all that stuff. It's it's not not it's not nothing. It's serious stuff, right? And so uh, that's another that's an, that that's called almost a hybrid between three and four. But we'll put it in three now, and you'll see how it gets more to four. But uh, you know, I'm not okay with it. Okay, Ms. Ms. Boss, Mr. Boss, you know, I accept. You know, you know that that was your expression of who you were and your assessment of me and my performance. But yeah, I am not okay with it. I'm not okay with it at all. And then maybe confidential of the year, second private of the year. Get your resume out there. You know, you're looking for a new job, right? So th th that's like more, much more serious. You see that we're, we're, we're stepping it up here, right? And then the fourth, out of the four, there's four of them, and this is the fourth one, forgiveness as I accept what you did as an expression of who you were at that moment, that's who you were, I'm definitely not okay with it, and see you later, all right? So whether it's this performance review, unacceptable, inaccurate performance review, or whether it's a, a, another kind of relation, more intimate relationship, a, a, you know, a, you know, a marital relationship, or a friend, to be friends, so forth, and they've been on notice, because you've already gone through probably stage three with them, right, degree, degree three, right? They've been on notice, and they keep, they, they, they've broken it, right? They've broken that, you know, that kind of basically an unspoken promise to comply with the agreement that you had and, and they keep breaking it and then you say see you later right okay okay because at that point you're past that point where the previous the stage the, 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 the degree the third degree one you, you know the reality is you got to remember when you, when you that this is the one that's a little bit wonky a little bit can be awkward the third one because like when does it morph and change into a fourth degree? That's mm -hmm. that's tough. Not always a clear cut line. Sometimes it's gray, right? But you got to remember the reality of when if you're in the third degree, the reality is that you need to accept. You know, the reality you need to accept is, is, is that if I stay in the relationship, I'm continuing to accept the potentiality, the possibility of that continued bad behavior. So you're, that's what you're saying when you're saying, yeah, it was bad, I'm not okay with it, uh, but, but we're staying together, okay? So you, 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 you get a, that's a tough one because you gotta, you gotta embrace that reality. The reality is that it could happen again. And you're saying at that point that you're okay with it. But then degree four is you're saying, no, you know, I, I, that's enough, and I and I walk, and you separate. However, that means whether you unfriend people and somebody on social media, or whether it's literally getting divorced or whatever it is. You know, um, I mean, in other words, legally, social media wise. However, in the spectrum of relationships that we have, however you want to look at. It. So. Uh, Yes. So that last category, you're not forgiving at all. No, you are forgiving because forgiving, but you're still thinking forgiving. You know, forgiving is defined as what here? Moving forward. Oh, okay. So are you moving forward? See, this is why I, I'm changing the definition yeah. the way most people think of it because most people they they don't they don't think they can forgive in the last one. That's a great point, right? But I'm giving you a different way of looking at it in Jesus' definition of love. Accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were. See, and let me just say, make one comment about Jesus' definition. What, what, what's the underlying thing in Jesus' definition? What he's saying is, he's, what he's implying is that going about the world, your life, and trying to change everybody is stepping on their toes all the time, isn't it? And so you're really saying, yeah, I don't really accept that. I don't, kind of, I don't accept that. You know, that's not love, he said, you see. And that's, unfortunately, when you and I 
perfectly candid when you think about our lives, that's way we probably we probably am myself, you know, nobody's perfect. You know, we've all probably been guilty of that, you know, that not really complying or following his definition of love in that way. But my point is when I when I when I when I, when I, when I, when I quote unquote heard that definition, I mean what am I heard heard I mean by heard it sunk in. <laughs> then I wrote this essay about forgiveness because I thought that's where that's the tough one, the fourth one, for people that can't forgive. But here's a way you can forgive because think of forgiveness as moving forward. And in this case, isn't that a good choice to make if somebody is abusive to you? Let's just call a spade a spade. Okay. Let's just say somebody is abusive in a relationship, whether it's friendship, whether it's marital, whether it's work. I've been abused in a work relationship. Okay. I've been bullied in a work relationship. Any abuse in any situation. Uh, and again, it could be emotional, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be any performance review is a form of mental emotional abuse in my, you know, a poor, you know, inaccurate performance review, the example I gave. To me, that's a that's a form of that's a form of abuse. You know, it's not accurate. Especially if the person knows what they're doing and they're messing with you. You know, we've probably all run into a boss or two like this in our lives, you know? So that 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 can we forgive? In the sense of moving forward, yes. And arguably, it's the best way to look at it because then we are acknowledging ourselves, which we tend not to do, don't we? We, we, we do everything for our children, or our employers, or our employees. And we, we do so little for ourselves, taking care of ourselves. That's key, right? And so this fits all of that. It puts that whole package together the way I'm talking about forgiveness as well, okay? So let me read you this last paragraph on page 58 here. Moving on, this is this is this is kind of wrapping up this idea that we talked about of the, you know, accept, you know, your behavior or whatever you did or said or whatever as an expression of who you are. Uh, I'm not okay with it, and see you later. Okay. So moving on in this way would perhaps be a way to demonstrate not only our respect and love for ourselves, which is the ultimate in self-love, right? But also showing our maturity as a soul, living with and relating to other souls in our many and varied relationships throughout our lives. A demonstration to ourselves and to the world that nothing is perfect, no relationship is perfect, nor does anything last forever. Sometimes you need to separate, and sometimes it may be the best thing. Moving, moving forward, moving on. So moving on may be the appropriate and the healthy thing to do. Right? So um, here you go. Other questions? I want to leave a lot of time for questions, and then if we have more time and you want to talk about other ideas in the book, we can do that. But questions about that? Discussion? Forgiveness? Anything? Any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in scenario four, mm -hmm. so you've forgiven, but you're out of there. And does that leave room for the person just to come back and be like, well, he forgave me, so I can, you know. That's a really good point. You yeah. have to just be clear if the other person taking them back that that behavior is unacceptable. Right. That's a really good point. Everybody hear the question? So the question uh, was uh, in, 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 in degree number four, situation number four, uh, so first of all, you're, you're you're forgiving the other person. It's not you being forgiven, right? Because the other person has been abusive to you. So you've forgiven the other person, but the question was, what does that leave the door open potentially for them to come back now that they do? Well, you forgave me, blah 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 blah. So the, so this brings up another point, which is boundaries. Boundaries are crucial, generally in life, but especially in that situation. Boundaries are really important. It's a really good point. And so I, I came up with this because I have a lot of clients. I have a lot of clients who are very empathic. You know what that means? They're very empathic. They're very loving, giving. They feel what other people feel. That's what empath, you've heard that phrase. People who are empaths. Their biggest life lesson is boundaries. And, and, and what is somebody else's emotions and 
feelings and what is theirs. That they have a very difficult time with that. So I have a lot of clients who fall into that category. So I I came up with this uh, analogy. It's kind of like we're all we all have a castle. Our castle is our mind. So picture a castle. And I I, I came up with this phrase that where that we are all sovereign entities. Our mind is all sovereign. Sovereign, what does the word sovereign mean? Sovereign, like a sovereign country, is a country that's a country unto itself, and it can make its own decisions. So the United States, Germany, England, Canada, Mexico, they're sovereign entities. They are unique entities. You know, we can't make laws that the, you know Mexican citizens can you know have to have to comply with. No, that would that would that would. That would, that would not make sense in this idea of sovereignty. Okay, so we are all sovereign Ma entities also. Our minds are. Each of our minds, you know, Mark, Mirapaz, yes, you know, Pat, you know, we all have, you know, sovereign minds. Each of our minds is unique and different from each other, okay? Their place personality, their minds, everybody's likes and dislikes, how we think, and so forth and so on. All of that is unique to each other. We are sovereign, so we're like a castle. So picture a castle with a moat around it. You know, a moat, <clears throat> you get the water and some of my, yeah, I got alligators in my moat. You know, depending <laughs> on you know, you know, what they're dealing with. Uh, you get a moat around it, you got a, you got a drawbridge, right? The drawbridge can later. So, so in the analogy, when I'm talking to some of my clients, I'll say, you, you have a moat. You have a moat around your castle. You are the castle. That is your mind. You, you have control over the drawbridge. You decide who you let over that drawbridge at any time, whether it's physically, emotionally, or mentally over the drawbridge. So it, it fits, right? And it's not to say that you can, you have to cut off all communications with the person. You may want to do that, but you don't have to. It's your choice depending on what the situation and circumstances are. Uh, like, for example, you know, uh, if you have children, you know, you may still need to communicate with your spouse and so forth if you get to for example, okay. Well, but still, that doesn't mean that you have to let the, the, the you know the X across the drawbridge. You can still talk to them from the analogously from the top of the castle, and they can still talk to you. But I ain't letting you across that drawbridge, you know, right? So that's what I mean. This, these bound, we need to draw boundaries, and we can have these degrees of boundaries. Is that in that analogy? You see. And I think it's a very helpful analogy visual, to visualize so that you can kind of apply different aspects of it depending on what the circum life circumstances you're dealing with in the relationship. And it, and it changes, of course. You know, everything is always changing. The dynamics may change in the relationship, uh, even if you're, you're in that stage four or degree four that we're talking about. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Great. You're welcome. Good point. Boundaries, really important. Yeah. Learning how to do that, draw boundaries, and the other the other nuance of that is learning how to draw boundaries where you can do it in as kind a way as possible, in my opinion, where there's as little hurt as possible, and yet the boundary is clear. You know, it's that it's, again, it's a lot of gray and a lot of nuance there. It's not black and white. But to me, that is the sweet spot. That's the objective. That's the goal. How can, when you need to develop, a, you know, establish a boundary, can you develop and establish the boundary in a way that there's as little hurt as possible, um, and yet the, the, the line is clear? You know? Yeah. Question? Wait, anything else? Yeah. Where does respect and disrespect fit into forgiveness? Respect and disrespect. Where does that fit into forgiveness? I think respect respect is always that that's a to me that's a given. That's like a that's like a uh, like a like a, a norm a, a norm uh, an element a factor whatever you want to call it that needs to be there as much as possible all the time. And when people are disrespecting. Uh, others, then that's I think where you got to take a vacation. You got to take a break. You know, and stop it because it, it just it just it de it degrades. You know, it's a, it, 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 and then the communication becomes not so clear, and then it's a shouting match, and then you get no. So 
the disrespect to me is, um, I think that's going to be fun, foundation, fundamental, you know, in order to have product, productive conversation. I'm not saying I'm a realist also. I'm not saying you can have that all the time with everybody because some people are just unreasonable, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to adjust your what's acceptable yardstick, you know, with that person sometimes, you know, because some people are just they just don't have a they don't have a lot of you know self-respect, and then they're if that gets expressed in a negative way, maybe towards you in that communication. Some people don't filter what they have to say. Yeah, some people are not good at filtering, exactly. So to some degree, when I've been in those situations, with, like you just said, that where they, they're not fil they, they don't filter well, um, what I tend to do is overlook their poor filtration, we'll call it, and try to deal with the essence of what the communication needs to needs to be in order for something to be productive. Because if I focus on their, we'll call it, you and I will call it this lack of filter, the ability to filter, their, their, their poor filtration, then I'm just gonna get up, I'm just gonna get caught up in all the coffee grounds here. You know what I mean? As opposed to dealing with the, the essence of the liquid that we really want to be dealing with. Instead to get caught up in the filter. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, because sometimes, and I'm not a psychotherapist, <laughs> I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a doctor, not a psychotherapist, but sometimes they'll use that as a distraction. You know, sometimes it can be intentional. You gotta distract you. So you don't wanna fall prey to that. So there's a couple, at least those two reasons to not get caught up in the coffee grounds, right? One is it's just a good waste of time. It doesn't help you forward the conversation. But also, it could be a ploy that somebody who's a little bit tricky can use to distract you from, you know, what, what really needs to be discussed, and perhaps negotiated if you want to use a business term, right? Not a good question. Yeah. Yes. Think about different sensitivity levels. So sometimes you're more sensitive to the sound of somebody else's voice, and that's why you might not feel sensitive. They don't communicate that they feel that way. So you're in stage three, but you don't know you're in stage three, and when they do the treatments and you move along, all of a sudden you hit, you get a four, and you don't even know how that happens. So, so hold on a second. Let me see if I can understand. Are you saying uh, this is who's who's that happening to? What you just described? Like between friends, like sometimes you say things to friends because you trust them and they trust you, but. Their sensitivity level might be different, but you don't understand what's going on in their head, and you think all is well, and then but it's not because they haven't communicated effectively. Yeah, yeah. So that goes back to your uh, unintentional disrespect. But if you care about somebody, then you probably, <coughs> like you said, kind of deal with the essence of it. Yeah, but that so but that sounds like a little bit more of a communication and clarification issue that needs to have happen, right? So as soon as you notice that, then you want to go and clarify that. Right? You yeah. wouldn't you wouldn't jump to four. You wouldn't jump to four in that situation. Right, if you felt that well, you, okay, by the state. To you because they felt you were insensitive to them and they misinterpreted. Yeah, you're saying by mistake And then you react badly because they have just insulted you in an elaborate because they've been seething for a while and you didn't realize it until you got the response and then you relax like, you know, take, take a chill pill or something, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, but, but that, so, so, so that is, so there's a couple things going on here. One is, if you need, if you need to revisit a conversation with them to get clarity, you can always do that, right? Because you're the one who's decided to walk or not walk, right? So you could say, okay, let's, let's talk about this. So then you could have a, like a, another stage three kind of thing, a degree three conversation, right? And you could you could walk back from the, the decision to, to, to be informed. But the other point is, is that um, they have a responsibility to be clear with you too. This is a two-way street, right? And, and then, so then you have a decision to make in terms of 
well, this is a friend of mine who's continually not clear. How much time and energy do I want to spend in that expend in that relationship? Is it worth my while? I mean, you, that's a conversation between you and yourself. You know what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because? I was going to say, that also shows a lack of respect. You don't respect somebody enough to um, try to clarify it yeah. um, and just let the agent through them. It's a, a lack of respect. Yeah. Yeah. But so, I guess it's emotional immaturity. It could be. could be. You know, you love aspects of a person, but you don't love other aspects of them. Right. You know? Yeah, that, well, that that last point is a great point because that goes to the, you know, Jesus' definition, as I keep going back to, you know, loving is accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were. But he's not, to use it, one of my students' phrase in, a, in another class I taught the other day, he said he, he liked that definition because a lot of times people think of Jesus and some of his teachings, and they think he was teaching people to be doormats. That's what my friend Right? And no, 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 no. So in that situation, Jesus would say, I'm paraphrasing, projecting, you know, but in that definition, he would say, no, 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 you accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were, means if they're being, in your case, emotionally immature and non communicative, or in your past language, somewhat disrespectful then you see that, you accept that, and then you decide how to act accordingly, having seen it and accepted it. What does he mean by accept? He doesn't mean accept it and like embrace it and kumbaya it. He's saying you're accepting it and you're not trying to change that. That's where the acceptance, that's what he means by acceptance. You see the difference? It doesn't mean I accept it, I'm your doormat, to use it with my other students. Right, right. Not saying that. Okay, that's a mistake. That would be a mistaken interpretation. Okay, so accepting the other person for who they are, not who you wish they were. In this case, maybe emotionally immature. Can you change them and make them more emotionally mature? No. Who can do that? Only they can do that. Right. That's what Jesus would say in that in that in that uh, rubric. You know that, that framework. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's good. It's very nuanced, you know. It's not, it's not black and white, right? But these are principles that hopefully you can take. You can apply them, massage them a little bit in real life situations, keeping in mind that the goal is to move forward in a way that's self-respecting, right? And as respectful to the other person as possible. And you're accepting the other person, you're not trying to mold them into something different. That's what he means by accepting them. You're not trying to mold them and sculpt them into something, the ideal image that you have. You really could be a great person if you were. No, they have to do that. That's a violation of their free will if you try to mold them in that way. Okay, that's what he would say. Get a paraphrase. <laughs> Pretty worse than his but that's you know, but that's what that's where the logical extrapolation comes from that definition. Okay. All right. Does that help, Mark? You get them? No. Yeah. Any, yeah. Yes. Uh, what would your advice be for someone who is in the stage four of forgiveness, but is in a situation where they can't walk away? For example, someone who's financially dependent on, on the person, or like uh, uh, someone who's under 18, for example? Yeah, those are tough. That's a really tough situation, obviously. And so if you cannot, you cannot. And then you, what, what, that's where, to use the phrase of my nonprofit foundation, you know, that's where turning within is critical. Because you turn, because where you cannot deal with the external in that situation by the way you define that. You can't externally. Wow. So, but can you internally strengthen yourself in that situation? Do whatever you can to kind of short, you know the phrase, shore yourself up, to kind of strengthen yourself from within, um, to, 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 to withstand, to deal with that situation for as long as you have to, 
until you can exercise your right to you know, leave the relationship or whatever, however, leave to define that given situation. The real, the, the, that's when you really got to go within. You know, that's analogously, as I said, just talked to mine. That's like, you know, people who, um, that's why it's like, the, you know, solitary confinement. It's almost like a state of solitary confinement that the person is in until they can escape, what's called, right? And so when you're in a solitary confinement situation, whether it's real or in this case kind of more metaphorical, what's the best thing to do is to go within and you strengthen yourself. Because why, why is solitary confinement such a, a terrible punishment for most people? Because they can't stay in being by themselves. They can't stay in being with themselves, you know? It's the, the level of self-love that we talk about before, for most people, it's just, this is not a damning state of humanity, but it's just reality. Most people have so many things that they just don't feel comfortable with. And so, solitary confinement, unfortunately, becomes a very good way to punish people. You know, it's causing them suffering. Well, in that situation where they're kind of, the way you, you describe it, they're kind of structurally or socially or culturally, whatever you want to call legally even, uh, in confinement, best, the best thing to do is to is just go with it and strengthen oneself from the inside out. And then, um, you know, pull oneself out of that situation. Later. But, you know, it's James Bond would do this a lot. You know, you're, you know, it's, you know, there's always a scene in a James Bond movie, if you think about it, where he is trapped and the bad guy's got him. And he's got him, he's got him with his hands and his feet and stuff like that. How's he ever going to get out of it? But he, he, he in a sense, uh, you can see something's clicks in James Bond, of course, in the character in the script. But what's written in there is that he does something internal. There's something he does internal that either annoys the heck out of the bad guy who's trying to torture him. And he tricks him. And he gets out of it every time, right? But 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 my my point of using that uh, example that we're probably all familiar with it is that what is he doing? He goes in and then he goes out. You see? He goes in, he gets out of there, and then he gets out, right? And then he gets out of it. So that's kind of an analogy. But it's the going in, finding some solution within, but also connecting. There's something about, you watch his movies, watch the way they're written and produced and directed. There's something, there's, there's, there's like a moment where he, it clicks, but he's going inside first. That's my point. The turning with that idea. Yeah, it's a tough question, but I think that's the best thing the person can do, because then they're strengthening themselves, they're preparing themselves for the opportunity when they can actually leave. And um, you know, that's a, that's the best thing. That's the best, the best, the best situation. Yeah. I'm thinking a lot of what you're saying, and I'm beginning to think that. There is somewhat of a danger in being forgiving, in that a lot of people find that they've gone through life maybe four or five decades and they find the light comes on finally that I've been dealing with self esteem issues all my life. I've never felt good about myself. And then all of a sudden it clicks. And then you're getting to that point with somebody and you're. But you're looking at that relationship and you're saying, okay, what's the giddy in this? What am I getting from this? Yeah. And I think oftentimes true forgiveness is very rare. I don't think it's totally possible in most cases because. But how are you defining forgiveness? In accepting what has happened and really letting go of it. I think that. People will come back and not, they will entirely, internally forgive. So what happens is it's perpetuating that lack of self-esteem because you really 
subconsciously right. not liking yourself anymore. That's right. Because you did it. You let that happen. You yeah. let that person back into your life. Exactly. Because you suddenly one night you just decided you can't stand being by yourself anymore. And, you know. Right. So that's a great point because you're right. It, it'll just be a cycle until you deal with your own inner self-esteem, your sense of self, your you self have to get there first, though. But that that that's crucial. That's but that's crucial. crucial in all of my essays. You'll see that is that's that's a fundamental. That's why turning within, what I call turning within, that's what I mean, connecting with ourselves in such a way that we build our self-confidence and we increase our own sense of self-esteem. Because if we don't do that, all kinds of things cascade from that. You give one a good example, and you just get into a cycle, and you come, and you just beat yourself up. That's why I ended up talking about this idea of self-love, because that's where the rubber meets the road, and most people are not self-love. Self-love is high sense of self-esteem, you know, and most people, most people are not. Again, I'm not a psychotherapist. Maybe you're, you know, you know, some people may need to go to therapy for that to, to really unfold and unlock that. I work with people in terms of techniques, teaching them, some of you guys know, which increases that sense of self-esteem uh, naturally. But the thing is, it's gradual, it's organic, it's not overnight. You know, you, you, you gotta be consistent with the practice and so forth, turning within, et cetera. And then the, the self-confidence grows and grows and grows and grows to the point where the issue that you're correctly pointing out doesn't happen. But that, ha but you're right. It does, it's not going to not happen. <laughs> it's not going to not happen until you get to that place where you're strong enough. Nobody's perfect, but so, that's why I use a phrase like enough. What's enough? Well, what's enough for that person? You know, it's different from person to person. But that person knows what is enough, strong enough, and then you feel like, oh, okay, I can handle this. I can be. On my own. I'm okay being alone, right? Be myself. I don't feel lonely being by myself, okay? That's a big one for most people. It's huge for most people, right? And it drives bad behaviors as well. Do you think that societally, uh, right now, we're at a place where there have been so many examples of bad behavior just out there that? We're going to be in a lot of trouble. We can be all united as a group in this room because we are empathetic people. But you get outside there. It's amazing how many people should feel better about themselves or what I mean there's a million reasons why they behave like that. But you you also I think it's handy to be a little bit intuitive, or to be a person who can read people, because it's a funny, funny place out there when you don't know people. It's funny who you can trust. You know, I mean, it, it seems like it's different, and it seems like people are meeting with their chins. Things that in a million years would never have been important to people are now important, and they've become flashpoints. Yeah. For nasty, rotten behavior. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's true. It's true. And I think COVID, the whole COVID lockdown and everything, I think that's exacerbated. It's made things worse. Because people don't like to be isolated. They don't like the solitary confinement that we've been actually been culturally worldwide involved in this lockdown and so forth. And it just increases the stress level. And then, it, and then it's like a tea kettle, like you're saying. And it boils and boils and boils. And is there a hole? Is there a hole in the spout or not? And if there's not a hole in the spout, to let the pressure out, then you have that kind of behavior. It just, you know, eventually it, it blows its, its top off. And so I think it's part of what we're going through right now that's worse. I think because of the COVID situation. I think there's other situations that I want to get into detail. So we can get way off topic, but you know, economically, et cetera, and socially, social structure worldwide, and autocracies and so forth, not just in the United States, you know, that thinking is, 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 is happening more, but it's worldwide. And I think essentially it's based on fear. I think essentially, if you really want to kind of simplify it, again, again, there's all kinds of complicated factors, et cetera, et cetera, but 
you just want to talk about it in the language that we were talking about together here tonight. I think it's fear, and, it's, and people, when they get fearful, um, they their 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 sense of their sense of self gets really put uh, to the test, and and when the sense of self is not very strong, to your, to use your language, the self esteem is not really strong, then the tendency is to lash out because the, this, there are other essays in the book where I talk about this. So I talk about this idea of cruelty. And so this idea of cruelty, how do I define cruelty? I define cruelty as, as um, finding pleasure out of hurting, being unkind and hurtful to other people. So it could be physical, mental, or emotional, it could be anything. Uh, financial, it could be anything, but hurtful. And, and where does that behavior come from? I think it comes from essentially um, a sense of low sense of self-esteem, and, and, and then, uh, ironically, it's driven by their, their behavior. Yeah. Their behavior is driven, the cruel person's behavior, is driven by what? The same desire that we all have, which is to be happy, which is safe, simply put, okay? And so, but if the person has very, very low sense of esteem, self-esteem, how do they make themselves happier? To get everybody or many people around them as possible, they depress them. So they bully them, they berate them, they call them names, they get stupid, they yell at them, whatever. Pick some bad behavior. But they depress the people around them. And when everybody's feeling worse, I feel a lot better. Because, you know, my self-esteem was like down here, but now made everybody else feel worse. Worse than I feel. A lot worse than I am. I feel great now. You know, and it's temporary. It's temporary. How to deal with fear in these times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I have two more books in the works right now. Yeah, <laughs> Do you have anything on temper? Uh, oh, <laughs> great. There's very degrees of temper up there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But also, I feel like anybody who is acting out, especially when I'm seeing that somebody got mad at and they yell at you, that is not really about being cut off. It's about something else. Exactly. So it's yeah. really about something else, some old problem and they're still working through it and they're not it's helpful to keep that perspective just, when just, you're dealing with somebody like that you know and, yeah. Yeah. and it's yeah. not you it's instead with some old problem that you're not dealing with and you can make that, that, that in the moment of meditation yeah. as well that something must have happened in your life you know or something that you have no idea and just yeah. move on you know? yeah yeah that's and a that's great hard. point we have no idea i mean i tell you i have clients who 51 countries now. Man, I am exposed to so much. There are thousands of clients, and, and they, and they, and it's so, so many, uh, what I call broken birds, is what I think is great. There's so many broken birds, all different ages, 15, 16 years old, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. Broken birds, and, and, and there's a lot of this, this notion that you're raising of being, not being, aware or cognizant of what their specifics are in their lives but just knowing what you what you what i know now about the complexities oh my god of people's lives you just it's just you can't tell by seeing them walking down the street they look okay do you get a sense from people sometimes sometimes yeah yeah that's what i've been typing in eventually sometimes yeah sometimes but you know it's just and then other times people will just flip. In other words, they're they're da, 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 and then whoop, Jekyll and Hyde, you know, that can happen. And who knows why? I'm not here, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't like it. it's not my work, it's not my thing. You know, I'm here to help people who want my help to move forward. But I see it, you know, I see it. And there's definitely complex stuff going on there that's above my pay grade and I don't want to go there. You know, that's somebody else's profession, you know, right? Yeah. I'm going to comment on what you um, said to Hillary in terms yeah. of the situation with her friend. Or yeah, her yeah, yeah, sure. Friend. And I think that going within and building your strength is, is very important. I mean, I, I certainly went through many years of having a stoic in one situation. Um, but the, the other thing, though, especially for a younger person, I would think, is to um, well, to, to create a life outside of that situation, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, um, and to strengthen yourself every by being successful, something that has nothing to do with so you ignoring that. 
but also to, to, to reach out to another person. Um, because otherwise you could become just uh, a little too isolated, I think, as you yeah. mature and get older. And so knowing that you cannot bear this person you know, to destroy you is, um, I would hope that in the building of self-confidence, this person would, um, you know, be able to trust somebody else to, you know. So I think that would be a, a good yeah, stuff. Yeah, good, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. If, if, if it works in the situation. Yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, go away with the person that's, you know, isolated and stuff. Right. But and that's what the internet's all about. Yeah. 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 All right, so what if you're in a situation where I don't accept what you did at that moment? Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely not okay with it. See you later. But then later, you decide that it's a good idea to forgive them. Do you have to physically go and say, I just have to forgive you after 10 years of, you know, we no, we no, we no longer speak? Well, but when you say, I have to forgive you, uh, you're, you're, you're mixing two different definitions of forgiveness, I think. Here, right? Because, so, I'm, I'm using the word forgiving them by moving, it's moving forward. Not, not saying what you did was okay, because it wasn't okay. So how are you using the word forgiveness? You, you say, I, guess I will go back is, and forgive them. I guess, I, I guess my question is, like, yeah. is, is there ever a situation where you don't have to forgive? Again, like, what do you mean by like, forgive? Like, See, I'm using forgive as moving forward. So sure, you can choose not to move forward. You can choose to just stay with the person and suffer. Anybody can choose that. You can always choose that. That's how I'm using the word forgive. So you need to so use use that language, but use different language if you're trying to describe something different from what I just said. It sounds like uh, you're saying you have to verbalize it to the other person. You have to make yes. them aware of it. Yeah, I guess it's not for you to really yeah. truly move forward. Do you have to verbalize it? No. Yeah, like it's no, this is internal. Yeah. You know, this is internal. This is internal. This is between you and yourself. You want to say something to the other person? Yeah, you can. Do you have to? So this is this 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 whole idea of forgiveness has been externalized. That's my whole thing at the beginning, right? It's been externalized. It's like, oh, I blame and guilt, and I gave you a hall pass and all that. No, I think that's I think that's a I, I think it's a particular. Personally, I think it's a lousy way of looking at forgiveness. But I think it's the way most people look at looked at forgiveness. I can't forgive you. I can't. No. It's internal. Am I choosing to move forward? Because, again, how did I start this whole thing? Control what we can control. Let go of what we can't control. Right? So I'm controlling things here by saying, this is, I'm controlling how I am going to, I'm choosing to react and frame this whole emotional situation relationally, I'm making that choice. I'm taking control of that. I'm not giving the other person who's been abusing me control. Right? That's essentially another way of saying the same thing. Right? Does that make sense? I think it's really important to acknowledge that the forgiveness is for yourself. Yeah. It's right. like that's benefiting yeah. you. It doesn't matter what the other person does with it. They could slam the door in their office and whatever, but you've done your part to clear your side of the street and you feel good because otherwise you're just hanging on and that person could not care at all. You're just like seething and wasting your emotions. You are in their control then. Right. Right? Who? Yeah. You know, you have said, in the, in the castle was the analogy, you said, you know what, this is my castle, but you can house sit here anytime. Yeah, you can mess it up, whatever. I'll clean up after you, whatever. I'm your doormat, right? We do that my other students, right? You know, if you've always thought of Jesus as teaching you, like, Jesus was teaching you to be a doormat. No! No! Right, that's exactly right. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that also maybe what you were referring to was the space between the initial problem that occurred. Time gives us a different perspective, mm. and sometimes it's not even accurate. So 
I think if we're going to go in and, and make that introduction, I think we've got to brace ourselves for how that person will react to us because that can be wounding if you are going with the expectation that they really care anymore about it. But I think that there's something cathartic about it. If you have been thinking all these years and you think, well, maybe, maybe I had an awful lot to do with that, but I'm older and I'm more mature now. Maybe, maybe we do have a common ground still. I've seen couples that all they needed was a time out for heaven's sake. You know, but then they ran into the divorce lawyer and everything, and then 15, 20 years later, they're back together. And it's in a brand new awesome. <laughs> this what, you know, they should have done. But it's really, uh, you know, I think time is a good for doing. Okay, I'll be honest, I did this with a relative. And, uh, oh man, she unleashed a tirade at me. And, <laughs> I was wounded. I got back in my car, and my mother was with me. I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> and I was hoping you'd get a little bit of empathy and, and cry on my mother's shoulder. <laughs> what did you think she was going to say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, see, but see, in that situation, I would say uh, what's critical is what, what, do you, why are you doing what? What, what, why did you, you know? Oh, I know very well. Uh, yeah. So, but, but I mean, but yeah. what I mean is, um, emotionally, did you go to that person with a neutral emotional, a centered, grounded, emo neutral emotional state where, regardless of what they said, after what you said, you'd be okay with it? That would be the ideal. Now, I'm not saying you can always do this, but that's the ideal. Because if we go in looking for acceptance and approval from the other person, we have zero control over that, and you can get slammed and uh, abused, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I'm suggesting is an incredibly weak position to be in, an undesirable position, I think is a more accurate word because then we are at the other person's mercy. Yeah, um, with this situation, I think that part of my sorrow was in that she was feeling hurt too, and I never realized. Of course, once again, it's that old thing of communication. I, I mourn if I lose a friendship, I really do, and people mean not much to me. And so what, what if the great friendship is abusive? Well, what if it's it, not a, is that really a no, friendship? No, that would not be a friendship. Right, It exactly. never would have gotten off the ground with me. Well, okay, okay. But, but I mean, personally, I, I won't speak for you, I'll speak for myself. Yeah. I've had situations where, where the friendships have gone south. So, you know, they've gone, and, and I'm out of my control, and it is what it is, mm -hmm. so I let it go. And so I'm not looking for restitution or apology or anything it is what it is and it's okay because i don't have control over that i control what i can control i let go of what i can't control and i and i respect people's free will decisions to make whatever decision they make even if it's something that's not desirable for me that's their decision so i don't control friendship Friendship is a relationship between two people, and it's a give and take, right? It's not some archetype third entity thing, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organic process. So anyway, anything else? Thank you for that. Anything else? Anything on me? Good, good, good. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, we, we, I wanted to end, and if anybody wants a copy of the book, I'll sign it and so forth. Uh, and uh, we need to close because we need to close the library. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Great questions. Great, great